UFC 305, this is the weigh-in recap show, full card predictions, and the betting breakdown. I'm looking forward to talking about each of the matchups on this card after seeing the fighters on the scales. So make sure you guys smash the like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn the post notifications on. Make sure you share the video too. And also note, I will be live for the entire UFC 305 fight card. Fight companion going down 6.30 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday, which is today. So make sure you guys tune into it. And let's get into the first fight on the card. We have Stuart Nickel versus Jesus Aguilar. I've been picking Stuart Nickel throughout the entire week. I feel like he is a very promising prospect, even though Aguilar and him are, you know, relatively the same age. I just feel like he has a higher ceiling. Eight no is a pro, absolute finisher, Australian savage. He's the number one flyweight outside of the UFC coming out of there. And his grappling control looks really nice. And I think he can out grapple Jesus Aguilar in this fight. Now, he may very well be tested and forced to go long. And I think we're going to learn a lot about Stuart Nickel. Jesus Aguilar missed weight. Let me let you guys know that right out the gate. He came in 127 and a half, but that's an interesting strategy because we have less time to rehydrate. That's why this weigh-in recap show is dropping way later than normal because in Australia, you only get 24 hours of rehydration until you fight. Aguilar comes in a bit heavy. I think it was strategic. He probably could have cut the extra one and a half. And I do think in those late moments when the scrambles are everything, that could give him a slight edge. So Nickel is the pick to win. But there is some like relative concerns to mention on the side of Jesus Aguilar coming in a bit heavy. We'll look at the scales. We'll see how we feel. Everything's feel-based. All right, we got Jesus Aguilar. Looking good. I'm telling you, this was not a strenuous 127. You're ready to die on the scale. I'm telling you, I heard through the grapevine he was eating quesadillas last night, and he made 127 and a half, man. He's got no problem making this weight. Come on now. Don't fall, don't fall victim to don't fall victim to the delusions and the lies. Stuart Nickel looks chatted up. Stuart Nickel looks solid. He looks in shape. He looks like a businessman. Like if you told me Stuart Nickel removed the cauliflower ear, was doing maybe my taxes, you know, he was a CPA, something like that. I wouldn't argue, even with the watch on at the weigh-ins. He seems like an intellectual, but he also can kick some ass. And I think he'll do well here. Now I do want to pull up the face-off. We're going to look at these guys going face-to-face -face one another. It was pretty high anticipation and intensity. And you actually can see... The physique, I'm telling you, Stuart Nickel is extremely physically conditioned, as pretty much all flyweights are, but I think he's even leaner than most. He looks ready to go. Good grappling strength. He's got those lats on him. I'm telling you, he's a strong dude on the ground, and I think he can positionally outwork Jesus Aguilar, put him in uncomfortable spots, threaten a finish, maybe get a finish. I just don't feel high confident on the finish call i'm picking stewart nickel by decision officially but he is good at ground and pound he does have submissions in the arsenal and aguilar's been subbed up twice so maybe stewart nickel's the pick though he is unproven completely minus 212 yes he's a favorite yes he's a chalky favorite jesus is plus 182 i think stewart nickel finds a way to take it home against a difficult vet over two and a half minus 130. Normally at flyweight, I would be like over two and a half. Absolutely. But here, because of Nichols' finishing ability and the possibility of a sub, I'm less confident in it. You know, betting on a debut in Stuart Nickel might not be a great idea, but I am picking him to win. But then take into consideration Aguilar missing weight. I know some people like Aguilar as a dog. If you picked Aguilar as a dog, you should be celebrating the weight miss. What is a Nickel win by submission sitting at? Plus 400. Not even worth a D-Gen sprinkle. Personally, I am on the stay away side of this fight. But Stuart Nichols a pick. I do think he ends up winning the fight. And the official method of victory call will be Nickel to get his hands raised on the judges' scorecard. Stuart Nickel and still undefeated. Welcome to the UFC. Let's keep running. Next fight on it, we have Kenan Song versus Ricky Glenn. I am stoked to see this fight. Now, it is a welterweight fight. If you only tuned in to Sunday's show, there was confusion. 
because Tapology had this listed as a lightweight fight. Now, all week, even if it was at lightweight, I was picking Kenan Song. He's a scary striker. And Ricky Glenn, to say it nicely, isn't very fast. To say it like an asshole, he looks slow as fuck on the feet. Rick Glenn is a southpaw. We can give him that positive, but he might get stung up by a straight shot. He's got that long and lanky stance, but man, his reflexes seem slower than ever before, and he was never a fast striker. On this fight with Song, he needs it on the floor. He needs grappling, and I don't think he's pulling that off. Song is going to be stinging him on the feet. He's got legit knockout power. He's in very good shape. I think that he can go out and win. He even did pretty good against Kevin Jusset, who's a highly touted city kickboxing prospect and trains with Izzy. So I think this is a squash match. I think Kenan Song is going to beat his ass. Now let's check out the scales, though. Let's see. Does anything shift? Both guys are on weight. And I got to pop out the Zin. Shout out to the Zin pouches. And let's see. We got Ricky Glenn. Listen, he looks like an ex-Marine, to be honest. He looks like when you were in high school and those Marines were trying to recruit you. Hey, man, join the Marines. This is him right here. This is a Marine recruiting Ricky Glenn. At 170, he does look more filled in. Kenan Song, he looks just a little bit surprised, man. Kenan Song just looks surprised by the camera. He's surprised by the moment. I think him and Song uh, Yedong, isn't he the uncle? I don't know. That's what I've heard through the grapevine. Is it true? Fact check me. He's uh, Song Kenan's biological, excuse me, he's Song Yedong's biological uncle, man. I'm telling you. That's not a lie. I'm not joking around. Let's look at the face-off here. Okay. And let's see. The face-off side-by-side. I mean, come on. Come on, bro. Rick Glenn is a damn former featherweight. And he's going to come up to 170. And he's going to kick Kenan Song's ass. I don't know what fucking planet that's on. Now, I guess Rick Glenn did catch Joaquin Silva with something weird. But damn, Song dropped Ian Gary. Song's done well in fights. Song is going to whoop Ricky Glenn's ass. Knockout win. He's going to destroy him. He's in way better shape. He's way more primed. Song is a confident pick. Song seems like a lock to me. Minus 200, the line has grown because everybody's waking up to the reality. It's too close. Minus 200 for him. Glenn plus 170. Glenn hasn't looked good. I mean, yeah, he caught Joakim Silva. He had some moments against Grant Dawson, who's purely just a grappler and doesn't really get, you know, the knockout finish ever. Uh, he looked bad even against Kevin Aguilar in a loss some years ago. Over one and a half, minus 153. Song hits too hard. It's too worrisome. Glenn's been knocked out in his past two in the first round. I like Song to win. I think Song is getting a knockout. That's plus 105. We're going Kenan Song, Uncle Song to get the KO of uh, Ricky Glenn. He's putting him down. He's putting him out. And we'll be dancing with the celebration for him as he gets a W. I like Kenan Song, man. Rep in China, I'm going with my guy. He's getting a knockout. Good fight. Let's keep on running. Next fight on the card. We have Tom Nolan versus Alex Reyes. Guys, I'm telling you, Alex Reyes is going to win. No, I'm joking. If you actually believe that, holy sh... Holy... I don't know what's wrong with you. I can't pick a 37-year-old. Yes, Alex Reyes is very physically fit. He's 37. He looks awesome, man. His physique looks nice. We'll look at it in a second. But this is fighting. Tom Nolan is a full-time fighter. Alex Reyes was a full-time fighter like seven years ago. He never had UFC success at all. He's got two knockout losses in the first round seven years ago to Mike Perry and then 11 months ago to Charlie Campbell. Tom Nolan's going to win. As much as I think Tom Nolan is a flawed fighter, it's because his defense is shit. He does not move his head. He's very stiff and up tall, which allows for powerful offense. Also, then when you get hit with shots and you don't roll with anything, you take some serious damage. But I'll be damned if Alex Reyes is going to knock out a 7-1 Tom Nolan. No. Tom Nolan for the knockout. He's going to lay Reyes out. He has to lay him out. Let's shrink myself down and let's look. I told you, Alex Reyes is fit. Alex Reyes looks in great shape. His brother just got a win, too. So I respect the physicality. He looks in really good shape. And there's Tom Nolan looking shredded and jacked. 
He's simply just younger, full-time fighter, taller, longer. I mean, everything favors Alex Reyes. The only worry, excuse me, everything favors Alex Reyes. Everything favors Tom Nolan. The only worry is Alex Reyes just catching him with a fluky overhand. There's the face-off with the shadow there. It looks like Alex Reyes is like a sunken in chest, but I promise you it's not that weird looking. Tom Nolan's going to knock him out. If Tom Nolan doesn't knock him out, my God, that would be an abysmal loss for his career. That would be terrible for him. I think Tom Nolan is going to dust Alex Reyes, who, like I said, he's just not a full-time fighter. No way. Minus 1,200 for Tom Nolan. Yeah, it's valuable. Reyes plus 750. I'm joking when I say it's valuable. If you haven't heard of sarcasm, that's a joke. It's a joke. It's not valuable. You can't do shit with it. Under one and a half, minus 260. Both of these guys get finishes or get finished, and it's normally early. I'm calling under one and a half at minus 260. And yes, Nolan by knockout. Let's look at that line, minus 400. Holy shit. Nolan by KO is the pick. The odds are abysmal in this fight. The under one and a half seems very live here. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have Jack Jenkins versus Herbert Burns. It's Jack Jenkins all day long. You can't go out and lose to Herbert Burns, Jack. Jack did well against Chepe. He won the first round. You know, he got his arm landed on and his shit dislocated. It was brutal, but he's coming back from it. Jack Jenkins is a good prospect. Nice striking game, good takedown defense. He's incredibly well-rounded. He's got a solid fighting style and Herbert Burns is a certified quitter he can't deal with adversity and that's like you know kind of asset number one in fighting he looked good on the scale he's a jiu-jitsu only fighter he hates getting punched nobody likes getting punched in the face but Herbert Burns responds horribly to getting punched like when they make fun of jiu-jitsu guys and say they couldn't take a shot Herbert Burns reactions to punches is exactly what the jokes are about Herbert Burns has gotten significantly worse also into his later 30s now. And he's a grappler, a good one. Stick with jiu-jitsu because he's not beating Jack Jenkins. This is a complete and utter squash match. There is Herbert Burns. He's just simply the less testosterone-fueled brother of Gilbert Burns. Like, we have to be honest here. He's just got lower T. You can see it in his physique. You can see it in his face. It's just how it goes sometimes. He's good at jiu-jitsu. He's a technician. Kind of looks uh, goofy as hell in that, to be honest. There's Jack Jenkins looking jacked and ready to go. Let's go, Jack Jenkins. This is going to be a beatdown. And let's see. Let's see here. The face-off. I'll tell you, do not be swayed by Herbert Burns looking in decent shape. He looked in decent shape against Julio Arce, too, when he got crumbled. And he's going to get crumbled here. I'm picking Jack Jenkins to knock him out. Burns will do okay in the first three minutes because he's about a three-minute fighter, and then he'll gas out. He might tap the strikes, man. I think inside distance is an absolute lock here. Jack Jenkins is going to dominate this fight. Burns has got good jujitsu, and he's good at catching people with early knees or quick submissions. Outside of that, fights don't go his way, and he's not knocking or submitting Jack Jenkins in the first. Minus 800 for Jack Jenkins. He's such a wide favorite. My God. Burns is plus 550 as the dog. He deserves that tag. This is a squash match. This is a setup fight. This is a showcase for Jack Jenkins to go out and absolutely end Burns. This shouldn't be competitive. But the reason that I think inside distance is superior to putting the knockout prop in your parlays is because of the possibility of a submission to strikes by Herbert Burns. He quit due to exhaustion in the past. If he taps to strikes, the official might call it a TKO, but they might also call it a submission. So if I'm there putting that in a parlay, yes, I'm not getting as much points, right? It's minus 250 for the KO, but it saves me on the back end if he taps the strikes because Herbert Burns doesn't do well with diversity. So I like the minus 350 inside distance. Jack Jenkins should definitely win. This shouldn't be a competitive fight. This should be a complete and utter squash match. The odds completely agree, and I'm in agreement with the odds. This is a real minus 800. This is going to be destruction. Herbert Burns is not tough. I've said this throughout the week, and if you didn't hear it, I'm going to say it one last time. Going through adversity is what being a fighter is all about. Herbert Burns can't deal with any adversity, so he's not a true fighter. Yeah, he's done fights. Yeah, he's been a fighter, okay? 
But when you're talking about real fighter inside, the dog on the inside, he's the tin man, bro. He ain't got no heart. Jack Jenkins for the W. Destruction. Next fight on the card, we have Casey O'Neill versus Luana Santos. The ladies are going after it. The pick is Luana Santos. It's an interesting fight. I think that my mentality here is Luana Santos just has way more upside potential. Casey O'Neill has lost two straight. Ah, she didn't look great against Lipsky. She got subbed by Lipsky. I don't know. I'm just not a big Casey O'Neill believer in 2024, man. She was an overrated prospect on the come up, and now she takes on Luana Santos, who's got really good judo, has really good jujitsu, decent pressure style. I think Luana Santos is going to land some takedowns, garner some control time, potentially lock up a submission too. I think the sub is live, but the official prediction is still decision because I never love predicting confidently on a women's finish unless for very few exceptions, right? There is Luana Santos. She looks fantastic. Luana Santos, wow. She looks great. Casey O'Neill looks pretty solid on the scale. She's in shape. But I'm going with the Brazilian. Let's look at the face-off. Luana Santos was wearing shoes and uh, Casey O'Neill was wearing slides. So I don't think the height difference is as significant as this. But Santos is a little bit naturally larger. I do think she's going to garner control time. I think she'll land some key takedowns. I think she'll have some big striking moments too. And I think she wins a unanimous decision. Uh, we will look at the odds in a second. And of course, I'll talk the submission line because Santos does have good jujitsu. Now, money line, she's around minus 145 as the favorite, which is just crazy fucking uh, close money. I was going to say crazy wide. What am I saying? And then O'Neal plus 125. I think Santos is winning. Over is minus 220, but there is the possibility of that submission. If you look, submission win for Luana Santos is at plus 600. How is that? Lipsky subbed O'Neal, and it's plus 600. So maybe a D-Gen sprinkle on Luana Santos to get the win by submission if you're feeling feisty. Either way, with the ladies' fight, I'm picking Luana Santos to win. Close money favorite. I do think she gets it done. She beats Casey O'Neill, and I just think she's got a brighter future in the game. She's young, man. 24, looking pretty solid. I mean, Agapov is a can. She destroyed her a month ago. But, you know, out judo the judoka, Stephanie Egger. I think that's a fair uh, accolade to have. So, Luana Santos for the win over Casey O'Neill. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have Josh Kulabeau. Versus Hikardo Hamosh. I've been picking Josh Kulabeo throughout the week. I'm a big Hikardo Hamosh fan, but he's got peanut brain, okay? His fight IQ is negative, and I can't keep doing this to myself where I go out and pick peanut brain Hamosh because he's talented but lacks fight IQ, and he literally sells. He gives you his neck. Yes, tap me out, please. I don't understand it. He's still young at 29, and he's, you know... I don't know, possibly going to improve. And I'm a fan. Like, I don't know. I remember early in Hamosh's career in the UFC, I always was like, man, he reminds me of Charles Oliveira. I just see this potential in him. But time and time again, he lets me down. How many times can I keep doing this? On the side of Kula Bell, he's got a decent striking arsenal. Danny Silva lost, though, isn't great. Lerone Murphy lost. He did go distance, whereas Hamosh was ran over in that fight. Let's look at the face-offs. I don't know. Something's tickling my insides with this one. I've been feeling it ever since the weigh-in. The official weigh-ins, I got to say, Hamosh looks in shape and good, but I don't know, man. Just look into his eyes. He just seems, he might be a dummy. I can't have to certify moron, even though I'm a big fan. I am a legit Hamosh fan. He's going to see this and someone's going to trend and say, man, this guy hates you. No, I'm a fan, Hamosh. Gulabel looks in good shape as well. Oh, let's look at the face off. Okay. 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 So Josh Kulabale has, I don't know, a real skinny fat look. He's kind of still got a pouch in the stomach. Oh, all right. So my thought process is just hitting me. Do I go for a pick flip? Because Hamosh has 
the possibility to outgrapple Josh Kulabeo, but he also has the fight IQ of a fucking squirrel and can completely sell for us. And then what, to chase an underdog pick? No, I'm not pick flipping. Nope. I'm going with Kula Bale, but as a fan, I really hope Hamos wins. He is an underdog. I mean, he's got good striking, and he's got good grappling, but Kula Bale is also a pretty good striker. He's got fast hands. He's got grappling defense. It's a damn coin flip, bro. It's a coin flip. It's a mid one. I really want to pick flip, man. I'm feeling it in my gut so strongly. I'm like resisting to ur the urge to pick flip to one of my favorite guys on the roster simply because I don't want to go against what I said earlier in the week where in the past that has absolutely crushed me. So you know what? As of right now, I'm sticking with Kula Bayal. I'm sticking with it for the moment. Let's look at the odds. Hamosh is plus 115. He opened up as a minus 105 favorite. Kula Bayal is minus 135. Oh my God. Kula Bayal might sell though. If Hamosh can just show fight IQ, but it's like asking so much of him. Yes, now, Hamosh, please, fight smart after you sold your past few fights. The over is minus 130. Hamosh by a decision is plus 325. I just feel this weird whisper that just keeps coming to me saying Hamosh is going to upset him. Hamosh might get him. But I'm like fighting the urge so hard, guys. Oh my gosh, I'm sitting here and I'm really just, I'm at a loss for words. I think I may be blinded by my fan-sidedness. I mean, who, he beat Bilal Gio, that's a decent win. The Melsic Bag, the Zarin sub, the Sung Woo Choi split decision has aged like shit. It's aged like a fucking uh, damn milk. My God. Kula Bell lost to Danny Silva last time too, but he's at home in Australia. Uh, I'm sadly going to stick with Kula Bale, but I hope that I'm wrong here. I wouldn't bet Kula Bale. I hope that I'm wrong. I am a Hamosh fan. I hope that he wins. I'm sorry for fading you, Hamosh, but you know what? Maybe me not picking him grants him the win. And as a fan, I am willing to take the L with the pick for my boy to take home a W. Ricardo Hamosh, I'm rooting for you, bro. But uh, Kula Bale probably gets a decision, man. He's just smarter. Hamosh sells too often. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, our featured prelim of the night. We got Junior Taffa versus Walter Walker. I've been picking Junior Taffa throughout the week. But I'll tell you something. Walter Walker looked leaner, and he came in at 252. He's lost some body fat. But, dude, his striking game is still abysmal either way. His gas tank looked horrible against Dreschke, and that's what lost him the fight. Granted, you know, Dreschke is an experienced veteran, I guess, per se. Junior Taffa, he lost brutally to Marcos Rogerio de Lima five months ago. He got his legs destroyed, and he's the former pro kickboxer, and he got outstruck badly. The concern with Taffa is simply that he has zero get-up game. Zero. He has decent takedown defense, but Volter Walker is going to look to smother. So we're going to have to check out the scales here. We're going to see. Volter Walker, look at the physique shift. Look at the change in the body for Volter Walker. That's a guy that's taking his career serious. And Taffa, I mean, he always kind of looks a bit fat. This is the Taffa look. For being, you know, Polynesian, though, he's actually pretty lean, bro. That might as well be in a fucking eight-pack, bro, especially compared to his brother. Let's look at the face-off between the two. We had a fun face-off. It was excitement throughout. Volter Walker is not taking Junior Taffa seriously because I think that he knows in his heart of hearts Junior Taffa is an abysmal grappler. He came into this fight being Volter Walker in incredible shape because he knows that he wants to pressure wrestle for three rounds. And I just feel like Volter Walker is at risk of being a dead fish. I know some of you guys thought I was going to pick flip with the Hamosh fight. But I didn't allow myself, and I told myself before this video, you better not pick flip the Hamosh fight. But I have this feeling inside that Volter Walker, in a physical condition like this, it's like Junior Taffa's glazed because of his pro kickboxing experience, but I don't think he looks like that good of a kickboxer. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh my God. Volter Walker takes him down. I'm seeing it. 
Volta Walker controls from top position. Tafa has no answer to the ground and pound. Volta Walker's going to TKO him probably. Volta Walker's going to body him on the ground. Tafa's game just simply lacks takedown defense, and now he's outsized, and he's dealing with a grappler who's in better shape than him. I think I'd be an idiot not to pick flip. So I am going to risk it. I am going to pick flip on this one. I'm shifting to Volta Walker because everything inside of me is telling me in this one, you got to pick flip. And it's not a fan-sided pick because I'm not a big Volta Walker fan, right? I'm a Ricardo Hamos fan 1,000%. I think Volta Walker's got a shot to pull this off. I think I might as well pick flip at least for the memes, if I got this feeling inside, we'll see if it comes to fruition because Junior Taffa has no get-ups. And if Volter Walker has the gas tank to wrestle for three rounds, Taffa is fucked. And let's be honest, if you watch my worst case scenario, UFC 305 video, what did I talk about? Worst case scenario is a smother fest from Volter Walker because that fight will suck. But damn, as good as his physical condition is looking, more MMA experience, way better grappler, it's hard for me not to do it. I'm going Volta Walker. Plus 110. Junior Taffa is just too worrisome. Yes, his striking is good, but he's the smaller man. And he's fat. If Junior Taffa cut 30 pounds off his frame or even 25 and then cut a little weight, he'd be a light heavyweight. Junior Taffa's a light heavyweight. Volter Walker is a legit heavyweight. He's 6'6". Volter Walker also has a huge reach advantage. He's my pick to win now. Over one and a half, I think is quite live. But if Walker gets on top and starts dropping some hammers, there's a chance he gets a KO. Plus 450. Walker decision is plus 225. I'm going for Volta Walker as the underdog. I'll tell you this. I don't feel like he's the most confident pick on the card. But man, something is telling me Volta Walker is just simply the better side following the weigh-ins. He's in really good condition. Like, what has Junior Taffa changed? What is Junior Taffa doing different? He's not training with any elite grapplers, man. Volta Walker's working with these fucking Russian wrestlers. You got to go Volta Walker. He's still young at 26. His improvement from the last fight could be vast. And I know you might be saying, oh, but Toph is pretty young too. But yeah, there is such a gap in the grappling skill set in this one. I think Volta Walker wins. He's going to pull off a W in his second UFC fight. I'm going with the brother of Johnny Walker. I'm pick flipping to Volta Walker for the W over Junior Tafa. The physique... The fitness and the dedication to the game is something that deserves respect. He knew he wasn't in shape against Dreschke and he came in like a fat boy. He ain't doing it again. Volta Walker for the win. Impressive. Impressive. Let's jump to our main card opener. If you guys are watching and enjoying, make sure you smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe too. We got Lee Jing Liang versus Carlos Prates. All week long, I've been picking Carlos Prates, and this is one of the most exciting fights on the card because Prates is a freaking Muay Thai savage. I mean, he's got Muay Thai title on his chest. He better be fighting nerds guy as well, has trained in Thailand, has a lot of kickboxing experience, even fought on a damn kickboxing card with Israel Adesanya in the past. Leech is a savage, but... He's not going to easily be able to close the distance against the taller and longer guy because simply Leach doesn't have a jab. The way Leach is able to land is pressure-based striking, but it's more hook-based. And I don't think he has the range for Pratis. I mean, I know he does, and he's got six inches less of reach. And Pratis has a lot more tools in the striking arsenal. So what, Leach is going to mix in takedowns now? I doubt it. Carlos Pratis has got this shit. Carlos Pratis might get a knockout. I've been thinking decision all week, though, because the leech has got a good chin. Let's look at the face-offs. Prates, great shape, physically fit, ready to rock and roll. Dude looks like an absolute savage. Looks like a mix of, like, Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, and, like, I don't know, some random Brazilian. Maybe a little Fabricio Verdum in the mix. It's like you blend all of them together, you get Prates. Then the leech looking absolutely jacked. He looks ready to go. The Leech is just happy to be back. And I'm happy to have him back. I hope he at least puts up a good fight. But man, I think Prates is a freaking problem in the UFC welterweight division. And the face-off was absolutely badass. Some snarling by Carlos Prates as he went forehead to forehead with the Leech. The intensity was through the damn roof, man. 
Yeah, I got Carlos Prates taking it home. But the leech is durable. But the leech has a good chin. Prates for a knockout. I think he needs some big body shots. I think Prates by a decision. He'll be tested here. But he's going to be able to outstrike the leech. Now he's a 4-1 to favorite. That line is too wide. Minus 400 for Prates. The leech is plus 300. I'm going with Prates to get it done pretty confidently. I respect the leech. So over one and a half at minus 170 is not a bad idea. He's always had a good chin. But granted, like I said, Prates going to the body could be dangerous. And with the big reach advantage, you know, you simply never know. A big shot can put anybody down. But I do believe that the leech will survive into the later stages. So I believe in over one and a half. Uh, Prates by decision is the official pick. We'll just look at the prop. Uh, it's currently sitting at plus 250 with a knockout at minus 120. Wow, high confidence on Prates just knocking him out. I don't think the leech makes it look that easy. I think Carlos Prates is live to take it home. So I'm going to pick Carlos Prates confidently for the win. But the leech will be tough and he'll make it over a round and a half. And Prates with a clean performance out striking the leech. If he does knock him out in the first round, holy shit, Prates' stock not only jumped a bit, it skyrocketed. I'm going with Prates either way. He's getting it done. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have heavyweight sluggers. Tai Tuivasa versus Jarzinho Rosenstreich. I've been picking Tai Tuivasa all week. I've simply felt that the style matchup finally is a chance for Tai to shine and thrive. Tai Tuivasa's got real big power. He's explosive and athletic. As much as he's a little bit of a fat boy, he's got good boxing. He's got nasty low kicks. He's got hand speed. And he does really well in brawls. Shit, he was the first guy to drop Cyril Ghan. Jorginho Rosenstreich is a quality kickboxer with a patient style, and he's pretty calculated. He's got a good job, too. I would say this, though. When you watch him mix up and exchange, there is an opportunity for a counter strike. I could see Rosenstreich hitting to Ivasa hard and then getting caught with something harder as he tries to square up and throw bombs. I'm going to go with Ty Bam Bam to Ivasa. I just can't fathom a five-fight losing streak and the fifth loss to be in Australia. It's not happening. It's not possible. No. The Australian air, the Australian energy, the Australian love, the Australian vibe, the shoey is destined to happen this Saturday. I'm going with Ty to Ivasa to find the chin of Biggie Boy Jarzinho Rosenstreich and, pill it, and put him down. Jarzinho Rosa looks fatter than normal, man. Jarzinho just looks more out of shape than I've seen before, but he weighed in like a little less than normal too. I don't know how that happened. He looks a little chubby, man. I mean, he always looks kind of chubby. I don't know, something softer about his physique. And then we got Tai Tuivasa. Listen, if you just show Tai Tuivasa's body, it's like the before picture of your fitness transformation. But listen, it's tied to Ivasa. It doesn't matter that he's got the gut of all guts, okay? He's got the hips like a fucking house. Holy shit. He's not going on no Weight Watchers diet, all right? Tied to Ivasa, you eat your damn food, man. You enjoy your damn food. You enjoy your corned beef. You just got to find a knockout in this one. If not, though, shit. We got to get him on Slim Fast or something. Call uh, call a doctor. Let's get him Ozempic and let's get the uh, 205 run going for two Ivasa. Who's in? I'm going with Tui Vasa to find the chin. Now, we will look at the scales. We'll see. How does everything look? Or the face-offs, I should say, because we just looked at the scales. Respectable and intense face-off. Tui Vasa with the hand up high. Rosenstreich staring into his soul. They're ready to go to war. One punch changes everything. And I think the punch of death comes from the Tai Tui Vasa side. I think he's got the power to make it happen. I'll be sad if Tui Vasa takes another L. If he's chinned, it'll be heartbreaking. Tui Vasa is a plus 210 underdog. He's grown as a dog throughout the week. I mean, he opened that plus 200. He came down a bit. And now he's plus 210. It seems like the masses are confident on Biggie Boy, who's a minus 250 favorite. Now looking at Tui Vasa to win via KO. That line currently sits at plus 225. I'm calling a Tui Vasa knockout. I think he wins as a dog, man. I think he finds the chin of Rhodes and Strike. I do think this fight goes under two and a half, but it's minus 460. But still, it's a confident call. I mean, it's a long shot in the parlay. It's not a terrible idea if you can add it in. Uh, ultimately, under one and a half is likely, but it could go a little longer. I expect to finish. Pick Tai Tuivasa 
I'm going with my Shui Vasa brother. I think he takes home a knockout W. It's meant to happen. I'm telling you, it's destiny. Tai Tui Vasa for the win. Next fight on the card is our featured bout of the night, Mataj Gamrat versus Dan Hooker. I'm excited for this fight, actually. Mataj Gamrat said earlier, I will make you all cry. I make you cry on Sunday. I make you cry. That's what he said at the press conference. I was like, damn, Gamrat, all right. Interesting, interesting tone, interesting accent. Make you cry. I'll be honest, though. He really sold me that he's going to make the, the fans cry because he's going to make me cry when we're sitting here and he's just laying praying for three rounds. I hope that doesn't happen, but he is the pick. I'm going with Mataj Gamrot. I think he's going to time some key takedowns. I think he's going to pressure wrestle Dan Hooker. I love Dan Hooker's striking, and it would be awesome for the fan side of me if Gamrot got knocked out by a slick striker like Dan Hooker. But it just seems unlikely. Gamrot's in great shape. He can wrestle all night. I think he's going to be ready for a hard fight here, and I think that he's putting Dan Hooker on his back consistently, controlling him in the wrestling transitions and positions, and I think he's taking home a W. Mataj Gamrot, by decision, is the official pick. He's just too much of a chain wrestler for Dan Hooker. There's the new look Dan Hooker with all the ink. He looks like an absolute badass. He's chatted up like 50 points. Holy shit. And then there's Mataj Gamrot, who looks in real good shape too. He looks intense as hell. And let's look at the scales or the face-offs. I keep saying the scales, man. Let's look at the face-offs. It was intensity, but it was respectable intensity. You can see all the tattoos on Dan Hooker. Hooker's going to give it hell. He's going to come out hard, of course, but I just think that Mataj Gamra is too good with the chain wrestling for Dan Hooker to strike all night. Dan Hooker's going to need a knockout in the first round because after Gamra makes him work for five minutes, that gas tank, holy shit, it's going to dwindle. And Gamra is going to be wrestling and wrestling and wrestling and wrestling. And I think his wrestling only gets better as the fight goes longer. So Mataj Gamra by decision is the official pick. I think he's taking home a W over Dan Hooker. As far as the odds, they, they suck. Minus 370 from Mataj Gamrot. Dan Hooker at plus 295. I'm going with Gamrot. I know it sucks, guys. I know. So worst case scenario is Gamrot via lay and pray. But uh, I think it's the world that we live in. It's our universe. I'm sorry, guys. Minus 240 for the over. And eh, stay away. Uh, Gamrot decision, minus 160. Hooker by KO, plus 700. I mean, if you just wanted to, like, degenerately sprinkle Hooker by KO to, like, cover something with Gamrot, it wouldn't be insane, even though I don't think Hooker is knocking Gamrot out. Granted, Hooker said at the weigh-ins where, or excuse me, at the press conference where he was a star, he said that there's a secret move in the arsenal for Gamrot. Knee up the center, probably an uppercut. He's got a big reach advantage, two inches taller, but ultimately, when they're on the ground, Gamrot's the bigger man because the wrestling game is going to be too much. People can shit on Gamrot's top control sometimes, but he's consistent with landing takedowns. And if Dan Hooker's tired, Gamrot's going to control him. Mataj Gamrot for a win. He took RDA down 11 times, bro. And RDA's a really good grappler. Dan Hooker's going down. Gamrot, the pick. Good fight, though. I'm excited to see it. And I hope it's more entertaining than I'm anticipating because I'm thinking it's going to suck. Co-main event of the evening, we got Steve Urseg versus Kai Car France. And yes, I say Lord Steve Urseg's name first. Steve Urseg is the pick. You guys already knew. I'm calling him the lock of the week because I'm going savage mode. We had to do something close money. I didn't want to lock a minus 700 or a minus 350. It can't be that chalky. We're going with Steve Urseg, money lineable lock. Now, I don't want to just talk the bet. I want to talk the fight. Urseg's the bigger man. Urseg has really quality boxing. He has a calculated skill set. He's really well-rounded. He's got the possibility of timing takedowns. Kaikar France has some power, but I think you got to walk into his big shots, and Urseg's not going to do that. Even though the reach you know, is going to be favored towards France or essentially even, I don't buy it that Kaikar France has a longer wingspan or rather a longer arm span than Urseg. It's just Urseg is an incredibly narrow guy. Like He just doesn't have much... Uh, with to him at all. I think Urseg's boxing can look good in this fight. I do think he can time some key takedowns. I think it's a competitive back and forth affair, but in Australia, Urseg's going to outdog Kaikara France. And uh, I think the Urseg 
fan base and stock only rises because he gave Alexandre Pantoja a really hard fight. Many people thought that he deserved to win at the moment, me included. When you rewatch, you can see why it went the other way, but it was competitive. And I think Steve Ursaig is going to take home another W against an always tough Kaikara France, but simply not good enough to take out Astro boy Steve Ursaig, who I think is, uh, you know, he's a new generation savage. I love his skill set. And I think he's taking home a win. Now, as far as the scales, Best Buy's best. Steve Ursag looks good. Listen, he'll sell you a computer, okay? He'll help you get the viruses off of it. And then he'll kick your ass afterwards, you know, when you disrespect him. Steve Ursag's a bad man. Kaikar France looks like a little freak, little gremlin, bro. Kaikar France, scary looking. Kaikar France does. Does he not look like a damn gremlin or something like that? Like, Kaikar France terrifies me a little bit. Yeah, Kai's got a scary stare, man. Let's look, though. Let's look at the face-off, okay? And let's see what we're seeing. And, of course, Kai Car France, he doesn't just look freaky. He does freaky shit. It's like he's ripping the mask off. My God. Kai Car, Kai Car France freaks me out a bit. He gives me, like, uh, Stone Cold Serial Killer vibes. Listen, if there's any guy that kicks that Serial Killer's ass... It's Mr. No Emotion, Steve Ursa. He wasn't even startled as Kaikar France put out the face that would terrify most fucking elementary school kids. Imagine he did that. You know, as you, you're on Halloween, he opens the door like that. I'm running the other fucking way. I don't need no candy from him. I don't trust that candy. Holy shit, Kai. But Steve Ursaig doesn't even react. Steve Ursaig is stoic. Stoic Steve Ursaig king of the nerds for the win in my lock of the week. And listen, I'm an Ursaig's witness. I've been a believer since the beginning, okay? He's taking home a W. Minus 170 for Steve Ursaig. Let me know in the comments who's Ursaig gang for life. Plus 145 for Kai Car France. You know I'm on Ursaig. You guys know. Come on. I've been talking about him all week. Probably going over at minus 245. Ursaig taking home the decision at plus 115. But the money line is the lock. I think Steve Ursaig is good to go. I think he's got this fight. I love his boxing. I love his fight IQ for the most part. Besides late against Pantoja. But it's a championship fight. It's Pantoja. It's a different matchup, man. I think the technical skills of Ursaig. Alongside of the size advantage. The jab that's on point. I don't think Kai Car France can deal, man. Kai Car France is good at striking for sure, but I think he's gonna have a really hard time landing anything super significant on Steve Ursaig, who's pretty technically sound, and I think getting better and better every damn fight. So, Steve Ursaig, my pick for this co-main event. Let's go, and let's jump to the main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. Drickus Duplessis versus Israel Adesanya. And this fight is epic. I cannot wait to see it. My pick has been Drickus Duplessis all week. And what does Drickus do earlier today? He causes some tears to flow from Israel Adesanya. He hit a nerve. At that press conference talking with Izzy. There's a lot of emotions running high on the Adesanya side. Now, just because he cried is not the reason I'm picking DDP. The reason I'm picking DDP is because of his smothering pressure. He's a come forward, non-stop pressure fighter. And he has a wrestling advantage in this fight. And he also has a ton of striking experience too. Yes, Israel Adesanya in the technical sense is slicker. From the long range is more effective. But Duplessis is going to close the gap on him. And he's going to bring this fight more into that red zone. And he's going to be able to land shots on Izzy. He's going to have Izzy on the back foot towards the cage, making him uncomfortable. He's going to time some key takedowns as well. Don't be surprised when Drickus is throwing some big ground and pound strikes. When he's bullying Adesanya on the ground, giving him a lesson in grappling. Drickus Duplessis is a problem, man. Undefeated in the UFC. Coming off the Sean Strickland fight, which in the moment we all thought was a bad decision. You go rewatch it. I did give him three rounds. I thought he got it against Sean Strickland. And look what Strickland did to Adesanya. But the narrative is out. Oh, Sean Strickland's win over Adesanya. No, Adesanya was injured. Adesanya didn't train properly. Adesanya was burnt out. We heard it at the press conference earlier. Disgrace. They're disrespecting Strickland bad. They're trying to, you know, delegitimize Sean Strickland's championship title win Sean Strickland's a UFC champion and it wasn't just an off day from Izzy it was an on day for Strickland and it was a bad matchup for Adesanya and another bad matchup is here is Drickus Duplessis 
Duplessis is going to beat him. I'm going with Drickus to take home the W. Now, as far as the scales, we're going to check them out. Israel Adesanya. You know, in pictures, he was looking freakier in person. He looks like Izzy. I mean, maybe just a little more jacked than normal. Like, the jokes were out that his face got bigger, so he must be taking HGH or something. But looking at it here, it doesn't seem to have that same effect. Maybe it's just, uh, you know, aging from taking the L to Strickland, you know, being a bit of trauma. I mean, I don't blame him. It was tough. He's been a long-time champ. He's been at the top forever. Even if it's win-loss, he tends to find a way back. But I think Duplessis got his number. And then Drickus Duplessis is looking absolutely jacked and shredded. He's in fantastic shape. He's ready to go hard for five rounds. And I think he's going to give Israel Adesanya hell. Let's look at the face-off between the two. Now, here, Adesanya does look in pretty great shape. There's the intense face-off, though. This is going to be a legendary fight. This face-off has epic moment written all over it. Like, I think that this is one of the most badass fights of the year. For me, how I'm feeling pre-fight, I think it's become the most anticipated fight of the year for me. All the back and forth, the freaking racial undertones on the fight, which I hope gets silence afterwards. I think we got to move forward with, uh, you know, we are all one mentality. I hope that Duplessis and Adesanya squash the beef afterwards and shake hands. I think that'd be a beautiful sight to see for all of Africa, too, to unify. Um, I think that Drickus Duplessis has taken home a W either way. He's beaten Israel Adesanya. The pressure style, the absolute savagery at the press conference. Drickus Duplessis is one of the most low-key, slick motherfuckers on the mic ever. He always has a response, and it's never emotional. So you got to love that about him. Definitely gifted, not just in fighting, not just in athleticism, not just in the physical, but in the mental, man. Duplessis a stoic man, and he's a real man's man. He made Izzy cry earlier, which is crazy. And especially because Izzy was kind of talking shit about Strickland crying uh, last time <laughs> on the press conference, uh, or rather on the uh, podcast with Theo. And, you know, now you got Drickus doing it to Izzy. That's insane. Drickus has got a crazy effect on these dudes, man. He must have some crazy energy. I'm going with Drickus Duplessis to take it home. And still, I think it's time for a new era. Adesanya's 35 now. He's a great champion. He'll go down as an all-time great and all the BS smack talk aside, I respect Izzy always. But it's Drick is Duplessis' time now. Minus 110 on both sides. I'm going with the even money. Drick is Duplessis and still side. I think we're going over one and a half at minus 435. We're probably going longer here. Fight starts round three is likely at minus 275. Looking at... Hmm, Duplessis by decision is plus 350. Duplessis submission is plus 550. I don't know, he could get like a face-cranking rear naked choke. I could see him on top of Adesanya out grappling him, but the official pick has been decision. I think he's going to mix in some key takedowns. I think it'll be a fairly competitive fight, but I think Adesanya ultimately is backed up for a lot of it, put into uncomfortable spots, and fighting off the back foot. I know Izzy's normally good at it, but he hasn't looked powerful and slick in a bit. I mean, I know he knocked out Pereira. That's fair. He did. But before that Pereira fight, think back. The Cannoneer fight. Meh. The Whitaker fight. Even the damn rematch. It was close as hell. The Marvin Vittori fight. Meh. When he fought Adesanya, excuse me, when he fought Costa, Adesanya looked god tier. But we haven't seen that version of Adesanya in a while. I think Drickus Duplessis has taken home a hard fought win. Unrelenting pressure. An insane determination and will to win and simply just being more primed. I'm going with and still champ, Drickus Duplessis. Those are the UFC 305 post weigh-in predictions, but we're not done yet. We got to look at some parlays. I had a slew of parlays that I dropped for you guys on this week's Best of May bets, and I won't lie. I still feel pretty good about all of them. If you didn't watch that show, you're missing out because honestly, that show's a, a certified banger. But if you're talking just confidence on money lines, I'm thinking that we could go towards something like a Prates. Definitely think Jack Jenkins, but inside distance is going to actually get you something good. If you go Jenkins inside distance, let's see, where is it here? Minus 153. Okay, Jenkins inside distance, Prates. And then I think if you add the steam of putting Lock Urseg plus 167 now, that's a good one. You want an alternate, you go Kenan Song plus 153. If you think the under one and a half, which I think is going to happen, plus 127, there's some ways to mix and match it. But Prates, Jenkins inside distance, 
And then Urseg, okay, on your lineup as well. There's something feeling good about these three all together in one. And then looking like you want to add Song in there, plus 300. I like this one as well. Uh, you know, Nolan Strait is going to do not much for you. So you got to kind of go under one and a half and hope for the best at plus 460. I do think Gamrot wins, but of all the high confident picks, there is a little weird feeling inside that Dan Hooker might catch him with a big knee, but that's delusional probably. And he's probably going to take it out plus 430. And then if you think DDP is taking home at the top, now you got D gen territory plus 937. But listen, we're trying to make something degenerate. If you want to add in a Volter Walker underdog pick, pick flip, now you got plus 2,078. Then if you're going real D-Gen, Tuivasa plus 6,000. But that's D-Gen territory, man. That's D-Gen mode USA. That's about as D-Gen as you can get. A little alternate action with a Gamrot, with a Prates. And then, you know, if you go jank and straight, you got minus 112, which is essentially even money. If you do go for that inside distance call on Jack Jenkins, you get yourself plus 115. A little alternate action because, dude, Jenkins should get it done inside distance. But I know there'll be a couple of people that will say, bro, keep me off the inside distance. I don't want to play a prop. I understand. I get it. So then from here, you go Keenan Song. Boom, plus 156. These three favorites should hit. You go for the under one and a half here. You want to go under action, plus 250. Probably comes to fruition. You want an underdog, you go Volter, plus 637. You want to go Tui, now you got plus 935. You add them both, plus 2,000. I'm feeling pretty good about everything that I said earlier in the week, though. I think that uh, we got some good calls. I just want to, I want to do like a quick little two-leg, though. Just straight two. Give me Astro Boy, Steve Ursag, and give me Kenan Song to take home W's, plus 147. And if you want just close money, then you go Drickus, plus 383. Then you believe in Protez's game, plus 520. Now you're getting D-Gen, though. Now you're getting into the wide territory. Now you're like, you might as well add in Jenkins inside of the distance, plus 698. I like this one a lot. Overall, good card. Some banger fights incoming. I think some guaranteed violence to come to uh, fruition as well. And I'm pretty damn stoked for this thing, bro. I'm pretty damn hype. I'm doing the fight companion too. Don't miss it. Those are some post weigh-in thoughts. But Wednesday show, I dropped some banger parlays. And I'm, I'm agreeing with everything I've been saying. There's been no pick flip on anything that was a confident prediction. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the weigh-in recap show for UFC 305 as well as the daily content for the card. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe. I do have daily content. We cover every event. We got news and more, live streams, fight companions. You don't want to miss a thing. If you haven't yet, smash the likes. And if you really enjoy, share the video too. Let your friend know. Send it to a group chat. Say, yo, check this guy out. And also, post notifications. Make sure you turn them on. Thanks for watching, guys. I'm checking out. W's in the comments if you got nothing to say, but definitely let me know if you do got something to say. I appreciate each and every one of you. Much love and peace out.